Good evening. Welcome to the final lecture of this year's Menno Simon series on Missiological Reflections on Mennonite Central Committee. I am Mark Jansen, Professor of History here at Bethel College and a member of the Menno Simons Lecture Committee. If you've been here at previous lectures, you have already heard of Alan F. Weaver's achievements in publication and his work as Director of Strategic Planning for Mennonite Central Committee. I want to highlight instead some older, still important connections. After graduating from Bethel in 1991 and before going to teach English with MCC in the West Bank, Allen spent a year at what was then Associated Biblical Mennonite Seminaries in Elkhart, Indiana, where he and his wife Sonia lived in the same apartment complex as my wife Alice and I, so we have known each other for that long. His earliest book publications were connected with Bethel, co-editing A Drink from the Stream with John Sheriff, who is here in the audience, and editing a volume of essays honoring Gordon Kaufman that appeared as volume nine of Bethel College's C.H. Wadel series. Alan, like me, is a native Nebraskan, but he came to Bethel and put down some deep roots here, as have I. I am delighted to welcome Alan to this stage. Please join me in expressing our appreciation for his work and for his being here. What does it mean to serve in the name of Christ? The previous lectures have explored different dimensions of that question through the case study of Mennonite Central Committee. Where does Christian service take place? What types of imagined landscapes does Christian service create? Who is understood to be engaged in Christian service? What regimes of power shape Christian service? How does a Christian service agency like the MCC negotiate potential tensions between the humanitarian imperative to do good to all people and the more specific call to support and work with, in, and through the church. These questions are missiological questions, questions that probe what it means to take part in God's mission to reconcile all of creation and humanity back to God. In this final lecture, I will outline elements of a missiology for MCC today through an exploration of the conceptual frameworks MCC has used over the last five decades to describe its relief, development, and peace-building service. Or more accurately, I will examine what I argue are multiple missiologies in operation within MCC, missiologies that sometimes come into tension with one another. I will do so by focusing on specific keywords that reveal elements of MCC's missiology, keywords such as presence, accompany, partnership, connect, dismantle, and measure. Oops, I was doing it earlier. Now I'm unable to do it. All right. For some, talk of MCC's missiology might seem strange. Words such as mission and missiology do not surface much within MCC's internal or external discourse. Writing in the early 1990s, MCC's International Program Director, Ray Brubaker, sought to fill what he viewed as a problematic gap by articulating a missiology for MCC. Over the course of a year, Brubaker consulted widely within MCC, seeking to discern what explicit or implicit understandings of mission operated within MCC programs. MCC workers, Brubaker found, seemed uncertain as to the nature of MCC's role as a church agency that does not plant churches, an uncertainty accompanied by a defensiveness in the face of criticisms of being skittish on mission or anti-church. MCC workers, Brubaker found, tended to associate mission and missiology with church planting. With MCC not having a mandate to plant churches, it seemed to lack a missiology. Brubaker recognized that not being expected to plant churches was in some ways liberating for MCC, 
It allows us to have a reduced agenda, he wrote, to approach people more willing to listen and to work easily with a wide variety of local church partners and to move into areas where church planting is actually forbidden. That said, Brubaker continued, just because we do not have a mandate to plant churches does not mean that we should not have a missiology. We need a missiology as much as mission boards do. If we are confident in what our mission is, Brubaker argued, we need not feel defensive or threatened when we discuss mission strategy with Mennonite mission boards and can give confident counsel to Mennonite mission board colleagues on how to go about kingdom work and doing so without being dismissed, well, that's just MCC. Brubaker recognized that even if MCC workers shied away from the words mission and missiology, they still operated with unspoken and sometimes partially articulated understandings of what service in the name of Christ meant, and so were guided by implicit missiological assumptions. Making these assumptions explicit, Brubaker contended, would not only lead to more fruitful conversations with Mennonite mission agencies, but also lend greater coherence and confidence to MCC service. Brubaker's project in the early 90s of seeking to lay the groundwork for a future MCC missiology reflected a broader desire within MCC to make foundational assumptions more explicit. So for example, in 1989, MCC leader Reg Taves, with assistance from Robert Kreider, compiled a set of what he called the unwritten, unwritten tenets of MCC's operations, an attempt to foreground implicit dimensions of MCC's program. Several of these 29 tenets captured MCC's implicit missiology. An implicit missiology is perhaps appropriate for an organization inclined, in Taves' words, toward a quiet witness in the name of Christ. MCC programs, Taves explained, were personnel intensive with people rather than money or material aid being MCC's most important contribution. The people MCC sent, meanwhile, did not arrive in communities with predetermined plans or strategies. Instead, Taves argued, MCC operated more as the facilitator of ideas and concerns rather than the generator of ideas and concerns, a stance that paired well with what Taves described as an inclination to second workers to other agencies, with a strategy of worker secondment reflecting a commitment to working through indigenous structures and a commitment to servanthood. Supportive partnerships, mutual relationships, the quiet witness of presence, these unwritten tenets of MCC's operations identified by Reg Taves in 89 had become increasingly explicit by the summer of 1992 when my spouse Sonia and I prepared to leave the United States to teach English at a Catholic school in the village of Zabavde in the north of the occupied West Bank. In communications with our supervisors and in orientation in Akron, Pennsylvania, we repeatedly heard a consistent message from MCC about the nature of our assignment. Namely, that MCC was sending us to be present in the village, to immerse ourselves in the daily patterns of village life, to gain Arabic language skills, to learn and appreciate Palestinian culture. We were not set with a predetermined agenda, but we were in te instead tasked with building connections and for forging relationships, accompanying one Palestinian community living under and resisting a military occupation regime that received major financial support from our own US government. Presence, solidarity, connection, relationship, accompaniment. These were the key words of the MCC missiology that shaped our orientation to MCC. Our pre-assignment orientation in Akron focused on building cultural adaptation skills and stressed the importance of approaching new contexts with open ears and inquisitive spirit and a readiness to learn. What our orientation did not focus on, however, was equipping us with pedagogical techniques and strategies to carry out our assignment as English teachers, nor on the importance of helping students achieve educational goals. Yet, as we quickly discovered, the administrators, teachers, parents, and the students at the school to which we'd been assigned viewed our primary purpose not as being a listening presence within the village, but as teaching, and they expected concrete results from that teaching. 
both in terms of greater student fluency in reading, writing, and speaking English, and as measured by government exams. So the mission focus on accompaniment, presence, and solidarity came quickly into tension with the need in our individual assignment to plan for, continuously monitor, and evaluate our success in teaching our students English. As I'll contend later in this lecture, the tension we faced in this first MCC assignment in holding together the missiological imperative of being present on the one hand, with the need to plan for and report on results on the other, is a tension that has defined MCC more broadly over the past two or three decades. In the concluding section of this lecture, I'll reflect on how the drive to plan for and measure results in MCC's work sits with MCC's missiologies of presence, a question that will in turn bring us back to the place of power in Christian service. Who exercises it, where is it located, and how does power shape understandings of what it means to serve? Before turning to those questions, I'll first trace the emergence within MCC program in the 70s and 80s of an emphasis on presence and accompaniment. On Monday morning, I described how, starting in the 1970s, MCC began to reconceptualize service in terms of listening to and waiting with the communities in which MCCers worked. This shift in how to understand service went hand in hand with another shift, a shift from MCC directly implementing projects to supporting projects planned and implemented by local churches and community-based organizations. The seeds of the shift were planted in the 1960s as MCC leaders rethought mission patterns in light of post-colonial changes. Some overseas efforts and missions and relief have been characterized by a paternalism similar to the attitude of Western nations in the so-called colonial period observed MCC Executive Director William Snyder in 1963. The winds of change toward political independence have likewise affected, uh, have likewise affected the churches and mission programs in the underdeveloped countries. Missionaries and relief workers today must adopt a true servant relationship to these younger churches, Snyder concluded. Painting with very broad strokes, MCC Program Director Edgar Stays wrote in 1976 in MCC's internal publication, Intercom, that North American agencies used to go around running their own programs, using their own personnel, and doing pretty well as they pleased. Eventually, the error of that approach became obvious, and we began to have a great deal of respect for the indigenous process. Now, Stays concluded, we much prefer to identify an existing agency <laughs> with which we feel compatible and support it with personnel or money, permitting it to enlarge its efforts. Also in 1976, MCC's board affirmed the importance of learning from and supporting local organizations. Our involvements will take place in a spirit of mutual respect, realizing that we must put as much effort into learning as we do into teaching, the board declared. Instead of viewing development as a unilateral process in which knowledge and skills are transferred from agencies like MCC to, to communities in so-called underdeveloped countries, this MCC board statement instead presented development as based on local capacity and self-reliance. From the late 70s into the 90s, these emerging understandings of development within MCC gained increasing traction MCC leaders increasingly began describing this listening stance of service with the language of presence or the slightly more active vocabulary of partnership and accompaniment. Several interconnected and mutually reinforcing factors contributed to this shift. First, MCC's experiences in the 1960s and post-colonial contexts in which nationalist movements in newly independent countries charted new visions for national liberation and development pushed MCC to begin revisioning how it positioned itself in those contexts, stepping back from viewing itself as a lead agent for change to instead recognize that the primary energies and leadership for change came from within communities themselves. Second, the rise in the 70s and 80s of civil society organizations such as farmers associations, women's cooperatives, and social service agencies of national churches in many parts of the Global South, 
pressed MCC to consider how it could support and accompany these organizations as they work to make change in their communities. Many MCC programs began to shift in this period away from directly implementing programs towards partnership with local churches, church agencies, and community-based organizations. Third, within, a broader, within broader missiological circles, a rethinking of Christian mission was gaining steam with a shift in emphasis away from sending missionaries from the global north to the global south towards a focus on how churches in both the global north and the global south might together join in the Missio Dei, God's reconciling mission in the world. This transformation of mission thinking meant a disruption of paternalistic relationships between European and North American mission agencies on the one hand and churches on the global south on the other and the beginnings of halting efforts to develop mutual mission partnerships between the churches of the global north and the global south. Finally, the failure of modernization theory to live up to its promises led MCC and other international development actors in the 70s and 80s to reassess their development models and search for alternatives. While modernization theory had held that, the, that countries of the global south would accrue steadily um, expanding benefits and improved livelihoods through the adoption of Western-style institutions in the realm of education, health, and economic systems, reality did not live up to the heralded vision. Development initiatives informed by modernization theory depended on centralized interventions by the state or external agencies such as the United Nations or international non-governmental organizations like MCC. As a counter to such top-down development, MCC program leaders began in the 1970s championing visions of development as emerging from community-led and community-owned processes. In a series of development monographs and in several occasional papers released in the 70s and 80s, MCC leaders like Edgar Stays, Nancy Heisey, and Tim Lind advanced this bottom-up mode of development while critiquing the optimism that drove modernization theory. So, for example, in surveying the development programs promoted across Africa in the 1950s into the 70s, MCC Africa Director Tim Lind highlighted the continuing failure of planning to accurately predict consequences of, uh, consequences of specific actions or to foresee new problems created by new technology. These ongoing failures, Lind underscored, should temper any residual optimism about the efficacy of such centralized development measures. Not only did development efforts based on modernization theory fail to live up to their promises, argued Lind, they were actively harmful, corroding traditional community ties and mechanisms of social support, effectively sorting out the weak at one extreme and the strong at the other. Development as modernization was atomizing, Lynn continued, releasing individuals from traditional community restraints by pushing the able to excel, by having as its ultimate goal integration into the world through modernization, Lynn concluded, development works against community. Countering models that equated development with industrialization, modernization, and westernization, MCC program leaders in the 70s, late 70s and early 80s drew upon the work of the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire and his notion of conscientization, a pedagogy of popular consciousness raising in which students, not teachers, are viewed as the primary actors in the learning process. Reflecting on what she described as the failure of school systems set up by missionary and colonial authorities in Africa to deliver Western-style development, MCC Africa program leader Nancy Heisey turned to Freire's idea of conscientization as well as to the notion of de-schooling advanced by Austrian-Croatian priest and educator Ivan Illich to promote an understanding of education and development as community-led processes rather than primarily as interventions by the state or by international actors. Edgar Stays also built on Freire's work in defining development as a people struggle in which the poor and oppressed are the active participants and beneficiaries, a conscientization process by which people are awakened to opportunities within their reach. Instead of requiring external intervention, development emerging from conscientization, Stays argued, begins as an attitude in the hearts and minds of people, 
building on their existing knowledge and driven by their own initiative. Merrill Ewert, who served as project coordinator for MCC in the mid-70s in what was then Zaire, also drew from Freire's pedagogy of critical consciousness raising in order to articulate a model of development education that did not contribute to domination. Such a Freirean model of development, Ewert explained, reconceptualized the role of MCC workers to be facilitators instead of manipulators, people who did not control decisions or the flow of information, but rather helped create optimal conditions in which local people can determine their own direction. In this development model, Ewert continued, there are no teachers and learners, advisors and advisees, or experts and lay people. All work together to solve problems. For MCC, adopting a model of development as conscientization meant reconfiguring its own place in the development process, taking a step back from seeing itself as leading or controlling the development process, and instead viewing itself as supporting and accompanying locally led efforts. Outside agencies do not bring development, Stave emphasized. Rather, he continued, development is an indigenous process going on before agencies like MCC arrive. At best, they accelerate its pace at worst, they frustrate it. Agencies like MCC, Pimland cautioned, must from the very beginning abdicate the executive power inherent in this position as implementer or planner. Rather than building up their own profile or controlling development processes, state our, Stays argued, the highest goal for MCC and other international development organizations should be to strengthen institutions which are locally owned. MCC programs in Africa took the lead in adopting accompaniment and partnership models of development. Beginning in Lesotho in 1980, MCC programs in Africa began shifting away from direct implementation of relief and development initiatives towards what MCC director Tim Lind called relational programming or a community worker movement. Spurred by what Lind and others within MCC viewed as the failure of development activity and by a disillusionment with development institutions, MCC programming in Africa shifted towards a model of presence involving the long-term placement of MCC workers within local communities outside of institutional contexts and with an emphasis on learning about and developing relationships with specific communities and their needs. These community worker placements, Lynn stressed, were not primarily focused on technical implementation of projects, but were rather shaped by a learning stance vis-a-vis -vis Africans. This missiology of presence started from the assumption that program creativity and renewal came not from MCC, but rather from African communities themselves. MCC's organizational stance within this vision of relational programming was a servanthood posture towards African churches. Adopting such a posture, Lynn stressed, was a better way for us to participate in and respond to the problems faced by Africans. If the shift away from implementation toward presence and partnership began with MCC's programs in Africa, it quickly expanded to other parts of the MCC world. So for example, the 1980s witnessed the establishment of an MCC Rural Development Program in the Atibonit Valley in Haiti. This program wedded a Freirean pedagogy of conscientization with the Haitian tradition of communal work days, or convites. Members of MCC's Haitian animation team took on facilitating rather than teaching roles as they engaged isolated rural communities in Haiti's rolling mountains and valleys in agricultural development initiatives. In a 1989 paper describing the MCC Haiti team's approach, Barry Bartel explained that animation entailed a facilitative process in which community members themselves identified their gifts, resources, and needs, and took the lead in developing and implementing responses to those needs, with MCC playing a supportive role. With their own planning, work, and sacrifice, Bartel contended, Haitian communities will own the solution, begin to feel like they can solve their own problems, and work to ensure that the solution lasts, with positive impacts continuing long after MCC animators have left the community. 
By the end of the 1980s, this missiology of presence and partnership had taken root in MCC orientations of new workers and in most MCC programs. In his report to the governing board in 1987, MCC Executive Secretary John A. Lapp explained that a ministry of presence suggests that need is best defined from the stance of being present rather than by strategies inspired by well-developed ideology, media headlines, or grandiose projects. While in modernization, models of, models of development, the state and international aid organizations led the design and implementation of large-scale initiatives to improve education, health, and livelihoods, in the accompaniment and presence models of development, MCC took a step back, seeking to support and follow the lead of local churches and community-based organizations, seeking not to overwhelm and usurp local leadership, Reg Taves observed, in turn led to preference for the small scale. If you make mistakes, let them be little mistakes. The missiology of presence was essential. People like Stays, Heise, Ewert, and Lind argued for relief, development, and peace-building efforts to be sustainable. The connections formed through service as presence, however, also came to be viewed as ends in themselves. The stress on presence and people within MCC programs reflected what Reg Taves in 1989 described as a growing commitment to reciprocity, exchange, partnership seeking the grace of being able to receive gifts as well as to give gifts. Service was not viewed as a unilateral movement from the strong to the weak. Instead, service came to be viewed as an exercise in connecting peoples, building connections across lines of national, cultural, religious, racial, and class difference. Can we advance the slide? While the specific phrase connecting peoples does not surface within MCC's internal discourse until the late 90s and early aughts, the idea had deep roots within MCC's history. As discussed in the conclusion of yesterday evening's lecture, building ecumenical connections across the Anabaptist Mennonite world has arguably been a core element of MCC's work since its inception, rather than peripheral to or a byproduct of its efforts. Similarly then, MCC came to view the relationship building by MCC workers as they sought to accompany and be present in marginalized communities around the world, not simply as an effective development approach, but also as an end in itself. Such relationship building opened up the possibility for what MCC liked to call mutual transformation, mutual mutuality, mutually transformative relationships. Such vocabulary was ubiquitous within MCC during the 90s and the aughts. So, for example, MCC's 1999 statement on the principles that guide our mission highlighted that MCC serves as a channel of interchange by building relationships that are mutually transformative, and that MCC facilitates interchange between its supporting constituency and those with whom we work around the world so that all may give and receive. A look at the evolution of MCC's logo offers a window onto the changing role of relationships within MCC discourse. In MCC's first logo, which was used for just two years in the early 1940s, and then also in its second logo, used from the early 40s through the 50s, one sees clasped hands in front of the cross, but with the clasped hands at an angle, one hand reaching up in need and the other reaching down to offer assistance. The clasped hands embody a relationship, but an asymmetrical one, a relationship marked by the power to give. In 1960, however, MCC adopted a new logo, still with clasped hands in front of the cross, but now with the hands positioned level, shaking in partnership. One can see in this third MCC logo an emerging understanding of service, not as a unilateral action of those who have, who have reaching down to those in need, but as founded on relationships of mutuality and common need before the cross. While the clasped hands disappeared from the current MCC logo, adopted in 1970, the idea of mutual relationship building is central to MCC's identity, 
as embodied by the clasped hands before the cross, only deepened over the ensuing decades. A missiology of presence not only opened space for local visions and initiatives to flourish, it opened space for MCC workers to recognize their own need, a space for a transformed understanding of themselves, not as self-sufficient persons who give out of a position of strength, but as persons also marked by need of different kinds, persons who need the gifts that others can share with them. In this missiological model, MCC service thus becomes entry into a space of mutual sharing and transformation. In its 1994 statement, A Commitment to Christ's Way of Peace, MCC articulated this understanding of service as mutual gift sharing like this. We recognize our own spiritual and moral poverty and seek to receive the gifts that others, some of whom may be materially poorer than we are, have to share with us. The next couple of decades expanded this conception of service as mutual relationship building beyond relationship building between people from Canada and the U.S. on the one hand and communities in the Global South on the other. Even with the assumption, even with the emphasis on mutuality, the danger loomed that people from the U.S. and Canada would still be foregrounded just now in their need for transformation. The expansion of the International Volunteer Exchange Program, or IVEF, founded in 1953 from a program that initially focused on exchange opportunities for European Mennonite young adults in the U.S. and Canada into a service program in Canada and the U.S. for young adults primarily from the Global South, revealed the relationship building did not only have to flow from the U.S. and Canada to the Global South. The multi-directional flow of connections and relationship building through service became truly globalized with the establishment in 2004 of the Young, Young Anabaptist Mennonite Exchange Network, or YAMN, in partnership with Mennonite World Conference, in which young adults from the Global South go to serve in other parts of the Global South, with connections and relationships built across the Global Anabaptist Church through service. Globalized modes of relatively fast and inexpensive transportation, at least when viewed in historical pr- perspective, have increased opportunities for global connection, especially for persons from the wealthier countries of the global north. Seeking to respond to global needs, Christians from Canada and the US, Mennonites included, have sought opportunities to help through various types of short-term mission trips, especially in Central America and the Caribbean, given their proximity to the US and Canada. Yet the extensive critiques of such short-term missions have highlighted how they threaten to devolve into harmful poverty tourism that reinforces paternalistic hierarchical relationships in which self-sufficient persons from the global north deign to reach down to help persons in the global south. In the 80s and 90s, MCC staff in Central America like Elaine Zuck Barge and Daryl Yoder Bontrager gave sustained attention to how the desire and passion for such mission trips on the part of Mennonites in Canada and the US might be channeled into opportunities not for unidirectional service, but instead for connection and learning. Building on their experiences in organizing what they called learning tours and work and learn teams, Zuck Barge, Yoder Bontrager, and others compiled a Connecting Peoples manual in 2003 that provided guidance on how to organize short-term learning opportunities that carried with them the possibility of transformation. Opportunities, in Zuck Barge's words, that help us look at new issues and places, listen to different voices, learn from each other, and live in a way in ways that create a more just, humane, sustainable, and peaceful world. One particular type of connection forged within MCC service by being present has been the connection of solidarity. A 1976 MCC board statement underscored the expectation of MCC workers being in solidarity and identifying with the weak and oppressed. A 1982 consultation organized by MCC Ontario on Native Ministries, meanwhile, reported that Indigenous First Nations leaders in Canada had counseled MCC not to just be another social service agency, but rather to become partners in the cause, with Indigenous leaders stressing that being there as companions was a political act. Connection is solidarity was, to be sure, fraught with challenges and complications. 
what MCCers wondered did solidarity look like in context of stark oppression and revolutionary change, um, like apartheid era South Africa, the occupied Palestinian territories in Central America in the 1980s. In 1985, guidelines for Mennonite Central Committee workers in contested areas, William Snyder, Earl Martin, and Atlee Beachy counseled maintaining connections with all segments of the population in the contested area to the degree possible and quietly interpreting MCC purposes. Yet MCCers sometimes found that partisanship among co amidst conflict was hard to avoid. So for example, Susan Claussen reflected in the mid 80s from a village in El Salvador that the people I work with have clearly chosen the side of revolution. As a matter of fact, it would be more accurate to say that they are the revolution. Gerald Schlabach, working with MCC in Nicaragua, observed that the church has taught and the sending agency has encouraged the field worker to identify with the poor and suffering. Now, however, the poor are, are to some extent identifying with an armed revolutionary struggle and organization. What next, asked Schlabach. And in apartheid era South Africa, MCC workers Robert Herr and Judy Zimmerman Herr asked, who interprets South Africa for MCC when the church in South Africa contained both oppressors and oppressed, those who bless the status quo and those who suffer under or work to change it. A commitment to accompanying the church and marginalized peoples now led MCCers to grasp with how to live as a nonviolent witness to God's love while also standing in solidarity with people revolting against and resisting violent oppressive regimes. Attempts to be fully present among and identify and stand in solidarity with poor, marginalized, and oppressed communities also challenged MCCers to consider the privilege they carried, a privilege they could not simply wish away. After multiple years with MCC in Appalachia in the mid-1980s, Carol Lepke wondered if total presence in and identification with marginalized communities were unattainable goals. I suppose many people in enter voluntary service with some notion of forsaking worldly possessions and perspectives to identify with the poor. I also had some of those ideals. Now I think that ideal is unrealistic, Lepke confessed. I believe that no matter what my intentions, the gap between me and the poor will never close or even narrow perceptibly. Lepke reflected that her education and family support system provided her with financial and other resources that always left a gap between her and the low-income Appalachian communities where she lived and worked with MCC. The structural reality, she concluded, meant that my attempt at identification with the poor is a weak attempt. Forging mutual connections across divisions of nationality, class, race, and religion in turn spurred MCC workers from Canada and the U.S. to push for change within their home countries to dismantle and transform lifestyles and structures that perpetuated injustice at home and abroad. In 1976, MCC's board declared that parts of MCC's mission was to sensitize our constituency to the injustices and human suffering which exist at home and abroad so that the church can participate in MCC ministries with greater understanding and follow a lifestyle commitment consistent with biblical and Anabaptist principles. MCC's global work in the 70s among communities facing famine and hunger globally led MCC to engage its Anabaptist supporters in Canada and the US about um, how their own lifestyles participated in a destructive global economy and about the imperative of conforming individual and communal lives to gospel imperatives of joy within simplicity, an engagement exemplified by the More With Less cookbook and a companion guide with ideas for living more with less. Gord and Tilly Hunsberger, MCC workers in Grand Rivière du Nord, Haiti, explained in 1977 that we experience frustrations when we see such great needs and the impact we can make is so small. Some of the necessary changes need to be made by citizens and governments of the wealthy countries, not simply by giving out of our surplus, but by more radical change in our consumer-oriented lifestyles. Transformation at the individual and community level needed to be accompanied by advocacy for transformation at the level of public policy and legislation. 
In the late 1960s, a Palestinian woman told Hedy Sawatsky, a Canadian MCC worker in the occupied West Bank, that what you're doing here is fine, but it's only Band-Aid work. Why don't you go home and work for peace and get at the root causes of evil and war? From the 1960s onwards, MCC workers increasingly identified US and Canadian military actions, foreign policy, and trade regimes as structures that MCC should seek to dismantle and transform through public policy advocacy. Accompanying African American communities in New Orleans and First Nations in Canada also raised questions for MCCers not only about what dismantling racism and addressing the ongoing dispossession of indigenous peoples would look like at the national level, but also about how to address such ongoing racism and colonial legacies within Mennonite communities in the US and Canada and within MCC, questions with which MCC still wrestles. By the early 1990s, some MCC leaders had become restless with the strong internal emphasis on presence and accompaniment, seeking to acknowledge and sharpen MCC's role in making proactive interventions in relief, development, and peace building. In 1994, MCC invited theologian and missionary Norman Krauss to reflect on MCC's work, with the end product a paper on a theological basis for intervention ministries. <laughs> Krauss recognized that a missiology of presence had taken root within MCC. We do not like to be identified as a social change agent, Krauss observed. We just want to be a presence to stand alongside, to suffer with, identify with, and learn from. Yet, Krauss continued, MCC does not send service workers into the various parts of the world merely to be respectfully and sympathetically present, but to be catalytic and dialogical change agents. Krauss did not propose that MCC abandon the language of presence, but did counsel that presence be conceptualized as a mode of proactive intervention rather than an end in itself. Such initial rumblings about rethinking the missiology of presence surfaced around the same time that MCC began initial thinking about how to engage the emerging emphasis in the early 1990s within the international humanitarian relief and development world on results-based management, or RBM, also often referred to as outcomes-based management. United Nations agencies and government donor agencies like the Canadian International Development Agency, or CEDA, and USAID started using RBM as a management process for planning for results. These governmental and intergovernmental donor agencies increasingly began to expect non-governmental organizations to which they gave funds to adopt RBM as well and to use RBM tools such as the so-called logical framework or log frame as the map for project plans, tracing the anticipated relationship between relief and development activities and desired changes or outcomes and identifying metrics or indicators for use in tracking and quantifying progress towards that desired change. Relief, development, and peace building actors adopted RBM as a tool for learning and documenting which initiatives worked well and which did not, and then making decisions about more productive and efficient use of resources. Given the fact that MCC, along with the Ecumenical Canadian Food Grains Bank, or CFGB, of which MCC was a founding member, received um, significant funding from the Canadian government, MCC had to determine how it would engage Canadian government expectations that the organizations it supported would adopt RBM. In 1997, MCC began implementing results-based planning in the 13 MCC country programs to which Canadian government money was applied, determined to glean learnings that would be useful in all MCC programs. In 2004, MCC's International Program Department piloted a standardized RBM project planning, monitoring, and evaluation, or PME, system in several countries, rolling it out to all country programs the following year. By 2012, MCC had developed a standardized project PME system for its work in Canada, the United States, and around the world. Could this new emphasis on measurement and results-based planning be squared with the missiology of presence, accompaniment, and solidarity that had taken root and grown within MCC from the 70s into the 90s. Some in MCC saw deep tension. 
For some, MCC program leaders, results-based management represented a distinct shift away from the missiology of presence. At an MCC binational board meeting in 2001, former MCC Africa Area Director Eric Olfert, when sharing with the board about the impact of MCC program in Africa, pointed the board back to the importance of presence, connection, and relationships, offering that MCC's impact could be measured by how many cups of tea MCC workers drank with community members. Some board members, however, wanted reporting on other types of metrics, such as increased crop production for small landholding farmers, or decreased dropout rates of girls in MCC-supported schools, or increased diet diversity for food insecure families. MCC, like other nonprofits, also found that its supporters increasingly wanted more information about the difference, including the measurable difference, MCC programs were making in people's lives. A thorough answer to the question of whether or not missiologies of presence, accompaniment, connection, and solidarity are compatible with the mandate to plan for, monitor, and evaluate progress towards desired outcomes would require another lecture. For now, I will simply observe that as director of MCC's planning and learning department, I believe, and certainly and sincerely fervently hope, that outcomes-based planning can be compatible with the missiological call to accompany and be in solidarity with marginalized communities. Certainly, strong critiques of outcomes-based planning have been advanced over the past several years. Historian Jerry Z. Muller, spurred by his consternation with what he calls metric fixation in academia, observes in his recent study, The Tyranny of Metrics, that obsession with metrics by charitable organizations can promote a short-termism mentality, an impatience, for example, to wait for development and peace-building efforts to bear fruit, and a skittishness to try innovative approaches. Meanwhile, anthropologist Sally Engel Mary, in her book, The Seductions of Quantification, has highlighted how social location and power shape the selection of indicators, how attempts to measure impact across multiple projects in diverse contexts lead to decontextualized and homogenized data that do not represent the full richness and of individual peace building initiatives, her particular focus in her study, and how fixation on measurement can bewitch individuals and institutions into thinking that only that which can be measured matters. Neither Muller nor Mary is dogmatically opposed to all forms of measurement. Rather, both stress that meaningful metrics are context specific and are developed with the active participation of people to whom the metrics pertain. Muller and Mary both rightly highlight that regimes of planning and measurement involve the exercise of power. For humanitarian agencies such as MCC, Implementing an outcomes-based planning system means asking questions about what type of power is held and exercised by whom. Who is involved in identifying desired changes in a community? Who determines what will count as positive change? Who is listened to? Who is ignored or silenced? Are project metrics identified by donors or by community members? How do Christian relief, development, and peace-building agencies like MCC prioritize different types of accountability accountability to governing boards, to donors, to the churches and community-based organizations with which they partner, to beneficiaries. Are monitoring and evaluation simply forms of control, or are they exercises in learning that are open to faithful and to radical adjustment, to fa or that are open to failure and to radical adjustment? How does an agency like MCC share power with partners, let alone, in Tim Lin's words, abdicate executive authority, when government authorities like the, like the Canada Revenue Agency expect MCC as a nonprofit to maintain control over money and other resources it gives to partners. No simple definitive answers to such questions are available. These questions identify tensions that MCC manages and negotiates as it seeks to maintain and build on the strengths of missiologies of presence and accompaniment while also working with partners to measure and track progress towards desired change. That said, some common themes emerge in how MCC talks about power and outcomes-based approaches to change. In May 2018, 
in response to internal questions about what constituted MCC's theory of change, MCC program directors responded that lasting change requires long-term commitment and happens when all members of a community connect across lines of difference to actively participate in shaping and implementing visions for just social, et environmental, and economic structures. MCC, the statement underscored, accompanies partners and communities for the long term, a commitment that helps guard against the short-termism mentality that Muller highlights as representative of metric fixation. Furthermore, visions for change and plans to work towards that change must emerge from and be owned by communities themselves if that change will be sustainable. Monitoring and evaluation, meanwhile, should not be exercises in policing to ensure that MCCM-supported initiatives have unfolded according to a predetermined plan, but should instead be opportunities for learning. And while MCC staff are undeniably accountable to boards and donors, ultimately they are accountable to the Christ whom they encounter in the hungry, the thirsty, and the stranger in communities marginalized by oppressive economic, political, and military structures. Over the course of nearly a century in scores of countries around the world and amidst famine, war, disasters, revolution, military occupation, and entrenched poverty, MCC has sought to discern what it means to serve in the name of Christ, has forged inter-Anabaptist, ecumenical, and interfaith connections that have opened new perspectives on who belongs to the household of faith and has grappled with acknowledging and with how to use its power. This history has included failures, surprises, and successes, moments of courageous faithfulness, and events that call for lament and repentance. An institution centennial is rightly a time of celebration. Part of MCC's 100 years to be celebrated, I would suggest, is a legacy of enduring self-critique. For MCC, its centennial should not be a time not only be a time of celebration, but a time for rededicating itself to ongoing grappling with what, serving with what serving in the name of Christ means and what it calls Anabaptist churches in Canada and the US to undertake. On the occasion of MCC's 25th anniversary in 1945, MCC leader P.C. Hebert urged Mennonites not to mark the anniversary as a time for self-congratulation but rather by renewed attempts at faithful service. I conclude these lectures with Hebert's appeal from 74 years ago, an appeal that remains relevant today as MCC prepares to embark on its second century. He wrote, the encouragement derived from the past should give us no feelings of elation. Might the past rather serve as divine precedent urging us to repeat increasingly the service then rendered how could we better honor God at this milestone than by rededicating ourselves to the continuation and completion of our present relief undertakings? In all of our efforts, may we give a clear witness for Christ and strive for the faith once delivered to the saints. With gratefulness for the past, redoubled zeal in fulfilling our present mission, and trust in God for the future, let us humbly yet joyfully continue in the work now but well begun. Thank you. Questions? I have uh, uh, our international partners, uh, let's say Mennonite, Mennonite church leaders uh, overseas reflected on the meaning of these terms, uh, presence, partnership, and, and, and so on, or... Are they just North American? Or is this, or is this a North American dialogue without without them actually articulating 
Yeah. I think it's an excellent question. And I mean, I want to do more research to substantiate it. I think that if you would look at like Mennonite World Conference publications, you would see some of these terms like presence, accompaniment, um, partnership. Now, of course, that somewhat begs the question of who's writing those Mennonite World Conference documents. Is that primarily people from Canada and the US? Um, to what extent is it actively being articulated by Mennonite leaders from the rest of the world? Um, I, I mean, and I suppose part of that question too could be is, you know, and this is just complete speculation here, but one could imagine maybe a, a, a Mennonite leaders from some parts of the world cynically asking, not cynically asking, but asking if the desire of um, not just MCC, but North American Mennonite mission agencies is using the language of um, partnership and presence, how much that rings true when there's a pullback in funding, um, from mission agencies or reduced personnel, like what you're asking, what type of um, depth that language has. Um, but I don't think it's so, I mean, I think that it's, it's certainly language that MCC workers have talked with other people about, but it's, it's clearly language that emerges not from, um, it's not language that it's adopted from other people, but it's from the people with whom MCC is intera interacting, but it's language that sort of develops within MCC circles in conversation with other, um, well, like Paulo Freire, um, other sources of insight, but it's, um, it's definitely being developed and the insights are being reflected on here in, in the US and Canada. What kind of uh, conversation is there uh, in within MCC about uh, the future uh, as we face uh, uh, the effects of climate change and uh, environmental degradation? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, whether it's what we call it climate change or climate crisis or other types of words, it's um, it's definitely um, part of an MCC conversation. Our Canada and U.S. boards in June, when they met in Ukraine, um, adopted strategic directions for 2020 to 2025, and one of those four strategic directions is to um, give increased attention to um, creation care and um, different types of activity around climate change. MCC in its, currently in its program is as it works in relief and development with marginalized communities around the world is accompanying communities as they adapt to the effects of the climate crisis. So um, climate change adaptation is definitely part of what MCC is already doing. Questions of what more could MCC be doing to what MCC has played, as, as we've talked about in the lectures here, has played sometimes a role of prodding Mennonite Anabaptist communities in the US and Canada. Could some of that prodding be around public policy advocacy um, related to um, climate change? Um, that's definitely what's being talked about is how we live into this new board mandate to be giving increased attention to climate change. Because it's whether we're talking about um, displacement of pastoralists, um, farmers dealing with um, the effects of changing climates, um, whether we're talking about climate change being one factor um, in complex um, conflicts over resources, which can lead in turn to displacement and violence. Um, climate change is having an impact on marginalized, especially marginalized communities around the world. Um, so part of responding faithfully to those communities is to find some ways to address climate change. I have a couple uh, questions, Alan, about outcome-based planning. Mm -hmm. uh, first, 
how, how do you see it as similar to or different from the models of progress that came under such substantial critique some 50 years ago? And secondly, how does it work in cooperation with or in tension with MCC's uh, longstanding value for ideological self-critique? Uh, that is, uh, it might seem that outcomes-based planning with its pragmatism is somewhat in tension with uh, ideological self-critique. Yeah, I think it really comes down to um, who is participating in identifying desired outcomes, who's participating in identifying um, the metrics that will be used to assess progress towards those outcomes. Is it MCC or the state imposing what those metrics are, what the desired outcomes are, or is it emerge? Are those emerging from community-led processes? And community-led needs to be parsed further because we need to ask: Well, who within a community has the power to be participating in those things? To what extent are women or um, people who are marginalized for different reasons within the community? How are they participating in those processes of, of identifying desired changes and the metrics that will do it? So the ideal, which MCC, of course, you know, like most ideals, fails to live up to sometimes, but the ideal is that MCC works at outcomes-based planning in a way in which communities are taking the lead and all, broad, all affected members of communities are taking the lead in identifying what the desired changes are to which they'll be working. In practice, of course, this gets very messy, <laughs> but that's the ideal that guides those outcomes. How does the MCC handle the fractionations, for instance, of Mennonite Church USA when it finally comes to your office? Here it splits people apart. Are you able to keep them together in purpose as when they hit the MCC? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, also, Mennonite Church USA has representative on our board as do um, Conservative Mennonite Conference, now called CMC, Mennonite Brethren, Beachy Amish, and as of just within the last year, Lancaster Conference, which is now called LMC, Fellowship of Churches, also has a representative on our board. So these churches that have been in tension with one another are also representing recent fractures, like with Lancaster Conference and other conferences leaving Mennonite Church USA recently, still ready, finding a readiness to cooperate through this collaborative mechanism of MCC. Um, so, but this requires a lot of um, time and engagement on the part of our executive director, our regional executive directors, people like Michelle Armster here in Central States, and the three other regional executive directors, our, our fundraising staff, other staff that in Gauge the different communities who come together to do meat canning, like it's just been happening up at the MCC office just north of us here over the last couple of days, or the different Anabaptist communities that come together to pull together relief sales. So it happens, I mean, it, it has an impact both at the MCC US wide level in terms of like our governing structures, but it also plays out at the very local level um, in terms of you know, is there a continued willingness on the part of people from Mennonite Church USA um, congregations to go canned meat or participate in relief sales or work at thrift shops alongside uh, members of these other churches uh, with which there are fractious relationships? I'll push you just a bit further on, on that point. Noted that one of the things MCC has been willing to do is to prod its stakeholder uh, bodies at times to uh, think further uh, into its perspectives. Uh, how does that relate to some of the controversies concerning LGBTQ uh, communities, which many would consider marginalized? Mm -hmm. And I understand there's been some discussion within MCC about its uh, personnel expectations for volunteers staff yeah. and board. Like no, that's an excellent question. 
Um, so, I mean, as I've talked about in the first lecture from its beginning, MCC, has, there's been, it's MC, both the collaboration of MCC has been a, a tenuous, fragile collaboration of different types of groups that call themselves Anabaptist or Mennonite. Um, and the meaning of Christian service is just, has been contested from the beginning. And of course, um, with the churches, Anabaptist churches, not just Anabaptist churches, but churches more broadly in the US and Canada, experiencing a lot of contestation and conflict over theologies of human sexuality, it's not surprising that MCC um, also is brought into that. Um, MCC's boards um, set um, expectations for um, MCC personnel, um, for MCC workers in the US um, and in globally, the expectation is that all MCC workers will be celibate except um, with the exception of being in a heterosexual marriage. Um, MCC being this collaborative mechanism of workers, volunteers from various Anabaptist Mennonite churches in the US and Canada, of course, includes Mennonites who, per, who are members of um, welcoming churches, includes uh, people who themselves are LGBTQ or have relatives who are LGBTQ. Um, and so it's a point of tension and sadness for some MCC staff of um, the fact that the boards have um, these lifestyle expectations. But as we talked about in the first lecture, this coming together of some groups in you finding unity and service, that also involves a drawing of boundaries and people end up outside those boundaries. Um, and so that's sociological observation is that even as you have this unity of Mennonite Church USA along with Beachy Amish, Mennonite Brethren, etc., finding unity on the MCC board, it comes hand in hand with the exclusion of LGBTQ people who, um, who believe that um, same-sex marriage is part of uh, faithful Christian life. So that's um, a reality of the reality in which MCC is struggling and um, seeking to find its way. I have a couple of questions. Uh, if you can forecast MCC's second century, um, do you foresee a, a shift in the center of Mennonite Central Committee to uh, something that more truly reflects the global center of Anabaptism? And secondly, uh, I, I was intrigued over your past several lectures about the, uh, um, the efforts that MCC went to in the, in the 40s to develop uh, study guides and resources for the young people who participated in the programs. And if MCC were to produce resources like that for its second century, what might those look like today? Yeah, excellent questions. So on the first one, about, about a decade ago, um, MCC started a a revisioning process, both for its structure and its vision and mission, um, called which is referred to as its new wine, new wine skins process. And part of that process included consultation with Mennonite World Conference and with Anabaptist churches around the world of Mennonite Central Committee should it become a globalized entity. Um, and that included a consultation, I believe it was in Ethiopia, of representatives of different Anabaptist social service agencies from countries around the world. And the clear um, response at that consultation was, MCC, we appreciate and value your work. You're an important partner for us. And we affirm you being a US-Canada agency that seeks to work in partnership with us as um, the agencies of, whether it's the Mesoregi Christos Church in Ethiopia, or um, Indomeno, which is a new um, collaborative venture of the three Indonesian Mennonite synods, um, 
and groups like that. So I don't expect the center of MCC gravity to be shifting away from the US and Canada um, because the global church is clearly spoken, but they are not looking for a globalized MCC, but for MCC to be one partner among many within the global Anabaptist family. Now, of course, and, and we and some oh, within the past couple of years, there have been some strong and positive examples of MCC collaborating with um, Mennonite Anabaptist churches in different contexts, like with the Kasai emergency response um, in Congo, um, or in responding to um, I don't mean to say earthquake, but it might have been flooding. Sorry, in Peru, um, of course. Within those collaborations among uh, between MCC and churches in the global south, um, you can strive for mutual partnerships. But then there's also the dynamic of MCC bringing uh, resources and the resources that it has, giving it power. And so, how to work towards uh, mutuality and partnerships while not denying the power that is there. Um, in terms of what resources could MCC potentially be developing? So we talked in one of the previous things, like during the World War II, civilian public service camps, there are, you know, had these booklets being produced, written by people like Harold Bender, E.G. Kaufman, others about Mennonite history um, and identity and commitment to peace. I, um, one thing that I know, that, well, one thing that has certainly been talked about and I hope will happen is, um, looking to produce something like what ha was produced back in 1994, which was a, a relatively short statement, but a statement that was developed in consultation with Anabaptist churches called A Commitment to Christ's Way of Peace. And so it's been 25 years since that happened. It seems that this would be a good opportunity for engaging the breadth of Anabaptist churches in the US and Canada and thinking how can we be re-articulating a uh, theological commitment to peace within our current situation. Um, so that's one resource that I hope will be developed. In my experience, one of the most important things that MCC has done is the way it's given the church a window to the world, um, an awareness of what is going on, um, some kind of base of understanding, looking at how it looks from the perspective of people from below. In this age of the fragmentation of how we get our information and social media and uh, the way in which our churches are getting information from all over the place. How do you see MCC's role in the future in addressing these kinds of questions of how, and I'm also thinking about the role that MCC workers have played in when they return mm -hmm. and they circulate around or when they end up in Washington giving testimony mm. on some issue. It seems to me that that's a real challenge and I'd like to wonder just how you think about that. Well, so on the latter part, we certainly do continue to bring in not just MCC workers, but partner representatives to um, speak um, with uh, representatives, to speak in other government venues in Ottawa, um, in Washington, D.C., at MCC's office in New York at the United Nations, um, and continues to do that. A recent example of that was bringing um, three people, one from El Salvador, I believe, another from Zimbabwe, I think the third, I'm forgetting where the third person was from, but who were all from communities affected by climate change, and they spoke, I believe they did go to Washington, D.C., but they also spoke in a variety of um, Mennonite communities, schools, um, churches about climate change. Um, so that type of itineration of workers is something that we do want to continue happening and are continuing to do. In terms of um, engaging with you know, a rapidly changing, um, shifting media landscape, I'm very glad that we have 
communications colleagues who know much more than I do about how to do that effectively, how to grab attention to people. And you know, the FCC workers are sometimes long-winded. I can say that as someone who's given four 20 plus page lectures right now, but that's not something you want to put on the website because no one's going to, well, very few people are going to go on the website to read long pages of material. You've got a very short period of time to grab that attention. And we've got people who are gifted in trying to think of how to use our social media presence in ways that engage people. But I'm glad that there are people younger and more gifted than I who are thinking about that. Alan, I'd like to go back uh, to the transition from sort of the 50s and 60s, maybe a traditional development model to presence, um, and then uh, I guess to outcomes-based management. Yeah, connect, maybe in there. Yeah. Um, sort of the international development model seems to have kind of come from the outside and MCC fit in there. Well, the, some of this newer, uh, things I think you indicated are also sort of out of outside uh, influence or other people were doing that. Where did, where did the idea of presence as what MCC should do come from? Does that have a similar sort of analogy or, or model among humanitarian organizations outside or, or is that a piece uh, that seems more native, I guess, to MCC? That is an excellent question. I mean, I'd be hesitant to say definitively that there's no parallel to in other organizations or within mission discourse, things like this, because as soon as I say that, I'm sure someone will come up with a good counterexample. Um, but I'm, I'm more hard pressed to come up with counterexamples. When we're talking about like development as community-led processes, that's definitely something that was, it wasn't just MCC that was grappling with, okay, modernization, the, uh, you know, models of development, really problematic, we gotta shift thinking towards things that are community-led, and then I guess maybe started within international NGOs, national NGOs, and then donor governments are using and co-opting the language as well. The language of presence, um, maybe I think does seem more native to MCC even if there are um, resonances elsewhere. And maybe also the language that is, well, the, and the language of accompaniment certainly has you know, theological resonance, but presence, this being with people of fellowship and <coughs> communion, I think um, it has you know, maybe more direct ties towards the, the theological language. Okay, well, a uh, couple quick announcements um, before we uh, thank Alan again for his uh, four lectures. Number one, you are all invited to a reception in the lobby. Um, there weren't any cookies on the table when you walked in, but there are now, so <laughs> take advantage. And second, you're all invited to the 2020 Menno Simons Lecture Series. Cesar Garcia <coughs> will be with us next year. So uh, please help me thank Alan again for joining us.